on now for you. Great. Well, I hope you all enjoyed your coffee break. We're back now with the next speaker, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Noelle Dowling. Now, Noelle is a native of Tralee, County Kerry, and she is the archivist for the Catholic Archdiocese of Dublin. Now, she previously worked for the Irish Christian Brothers in the Allen Library and with Dublin City Council Archives. She holds an MA from University College Cork and a HDIP in Archival Studies from University College Dublin. Noelle is actively involved in promoting the long-term preservation and access to church archives both in Ireland and abroad. She is the current chairperson of the Association for Church Archives Ireland, and Noelle will be talking to us today about a fantastic Leeson, Father Francis Leeson, who is chaplain to the Royal Munster Fusiliers. So can you please give a warm welcome for Noelle Dowling. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak to you here today. Um, thank you, Morris. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here to speak about Father Francis Gleeson. Um, being an archivist, I think you have to be nosy. Uh, you spend a lot of time reading through people's personal letters, diaries, everything like that. Some people you get great fondness for, others you don't particularly like. In this instance, I love Father Gleeson, absolutely love him. And it was the first box I opened when I began working the diocese many, many years ago. And I will never forget just seeing all of the notebooks and diaries and opening them and putting them away quite quickly because his writing is appalling. Um, but it was the first collection I ever catalogued, so it will always um, be very special. So his papers consist of 30 items, which include diaries, brigade rule books, and letters addressed to Father Gleeson. And when these were digitized, these 30 items ended up as 670 digital scans. When Father Gleeson died, these diaries were left in St. Catherine's and Mead Street, and they could very easily have gone in the dustbin. But one of his colleagues there, Father John Maher, who was another temporary man, took them into his care, and when Father Matter died, they came into the custody of the archives. Um, like, as I said to you before, just a few things to look out for when I show you the slides. Uh, Father Gleeson wrote mainly in pencil. His handwriting is extremely small, and it's not the easiest to read. He spelled place names with as many versions as there possibly could be, and the same with surnames. He censored a lot of the material himself, um, we don't know why. And the other thing he did was he used a lot of abbreviations and codes that were only known to him. So one of the tasks we did in 2014 was to transcribe all of his material because there was a huge interest with this decade of um, commemoration. And we were fearful that damage would happen to them. Um, but as we went along, we... I suppose to aid researchers, any of the abbreviations we came across, we actually took note of and expanded. Um, but there was one particular set that caused us a lot of headaches. Uh, we had the names of the soldiers, we had their addresses, we had their next to kin. Sometimes behind them we'd have a W or a K, which we worked out as being wounded or killed, and dates. But beside other men's names, it was just a series of date after date after date with nothing to kind of indicate what it was. And then we had the eureka moment. Father Gleeson was actually recording when the men received the sacraments, making sure that they were well prepared for what was probably an inevitable death. So here we have a photograph of Father Gleeson in the trenches. So who was it? Well, he was born on the 28th of May, 1884, in Templemore, here in Tipperary, and uh, I know we have some relatives in the audience here today. He was one of 13 children. He was educated for the priesthood at Holy Cross College, Clanliffe, in Dublin, and he finished his studies at St. Patrick's College in Maynooth, where he was ordained in 1910. He was the first Irish Catholic priest to enlist as a chaplain with the British Expeditionary Force during the First World War. He applied to enlist as a military chaplain as early as the 6th of October 1914. He had been seriously ill as a young child 
and like every Irish good mother, she didn't want her son going off to war. So she wrote directly to Cardinal Board of Westminster, who was responsible for the recruitment of Catholic chaplains, asking him not to accept her son. She stated that he was not a fit subject, either physically or mentally, for any hardship. He's very young and rather delicate, and also his sight is defective. But obviously, her plea fell on deaf ears. Father Gleason initially signed up for one year, which was the practice. He was based in the area around northern France and southern Belgium, and he was responsible for the, self, the spiritual welfare of the Royal Munster Fusiliers. But he was so traumatized after his first year, he relinquished his commission on the 19th of November 1915. He returned to Ireland, and within six months, of course, the rising was happening practically outside his doorstep in Dublin. But he didn't re leave any account of his feelings about all of that. He felt a very strong attachment to the men that he had served with, and if there had been more chaplains available, he may not have made the decision, which was to go back for a second time. And he rejoined the second Munsters in France in May 1917, and completed his second year stint as a military chaplain in May 1919, when he was demobilized. He returned to parish duties in Dublin. His last appointment was as parish priest at St. Catherine's in Mead Street, um, which happened in 1944. He was a very highly regarded priest of the Dublin Archdiocese, and was made a canon of the Metropolitan Chapter in 1956, and the chapter at that stage would have been advisors to the Archbishop. And Father Gleeson passed away on the 26th of June, 1959. So, we're going to take a look at, firstly, his brigade roll books. And in the first one, it basically said, this belongs to Francis Gleeson, and it's the Great War, 1914 to 15. So, for family historians, the brigade roll books are a great source of information. Father Gleeson took his job as a chaplain very seriously, and one of the things he did was list the name of every man in his charge, along with their service number, their next to kin, and address. On occasion, you find the names of men from different regiments and also from different religions. So Father Gleeson was ecumenical long before anybody else really was. In some instances, he noted the physical characteristics of a person. And over on the far side, at number 6323, there's a man by the name of McMahon P, and in brackets after his name is Tall. So obviously there was a short P McMahon as well. He also used the pages to record specific, specific events he wanted to remember. So on the opposite page at the top here, at 4462, we have a man by the name of Story, and in brackets, right thigh, shrapnel, also arm. And the longer entry relates to a man by the name of Dick O'Brien, who carried a green flag right over the parapet of the Germans, with the flag wrapped around his bayonet. And his friend Meehan saw him do this, and saw him wave the flag while he was in the German trench, and a few moments later, he was killed. Again, you have the list of names here, and more notes. Here we learn that poor Mian from the previous brigade roll book was killed literally outside the barbed wire of their own trench. Sullivan, the bomb thrower, had the side of his face blown off, and he died clutching his rosary beads. Now, this is important because saying the rosary in the, tension, in the trenches or in a blown up building was very commonplace. The men loved when packages arrived from home and there was holy pictures, scapulars, rosary beads in them and there was always a demand for them. Father Gleason himself had a small portable order, altar and the men were always happy to clear a space for him to say mass. And within minutes there could be 200 to 300 people turned up. Um, and they weren't always members of just the Catholic faith. In this one, we hear that Parker, who was an officer, is dying, but he wants his mother to be told that he died a hero. But it really is the diaries that are the most incredible um, items in, in the collection as such. Um, and Father Gleason was amazing to, to, to write as much as he did. Um, a lot of the evidence about Father Gleason isn't just from the diaries. Men wrote to the newspapers about him years afterwards, and one man recalled, he said mass for us on Christmas Day, actually in the firing line, where he had his little altar was peppered with bullets. 
He's a grand priest and knows no fear. He's never finished doing all in his power for everyone, even those who are not of the same religion. Nothing gives him greater pleasure than saying mass in the open, in cold and wet, or hearing confessions in some old barn that has been half blown away by German and shell fire. And it's from the diaries that we learned so much about what was happening. And as I said, like he was doing this and keeping these diaries in the midst of all the fighting and shelling and everything. Unfortunately, I can't tell you a lot about or read all the diaries for you today, but I have taken some snippets. I apologize for the ones that are going to completely depress you, um, but I have some ones with a bit of humor as well. On Christmas Day, 1914, he wrote, Anyhow, I carried out my desire and gave the monsters mass today. Almost half of the battalion was in reserve and the other half in the trenches. The night froze very, very hard, with the result that the roads to the fighting line were well hardened. Were it not for that, I should have had to go through an absolute river of mud and muck. Such desolation, such suffering. If all militaries had hearts at all, they should bleed if they saw the scene of frozen men I saw today, this Christmas day of 1914. I got to the reserve monsters. At once they got me a table from the ruined house in which the men were billeted and set up my altar. What a little gem that portable altar is that I got from Burns and Oates in London. In a few minutes, almost 250 or 300 monsters were assembled outside this shattered and terrifically upset house. And I went on with mass. Sergeant Major Lee, he served. Well, it was a unique Christmas, bullets whizzing over our heads the whole time. And during the consecration, several bullets passed by. The morning was densely foggy, and so we were quite free from airplane observation. Otherwise, we would have been shelled mercilessly. What a strange Christmas morning. Such an historic one for me and the fine Church of England chaplain I met there at the billets, who gave his services to the Welsh Regiment. I had no candles, but two thick butts were soon discovered and were stuck safely in the altar table. Nearly all of the Church of Englanders gladly came of their own accord to assist at our open air mass. Before beginning, I spoke a word to the men who stood or knelt round in a circle round the outside of this emptied house and told them I was offering the sacrifice for the monsters who were killed on Tuesday last, for their wives, sisters, brothers, and mothers. Secondly, for the men of our own regiment, up to 200, who were wounded on that dreadful night of carnage, when we lost 11 officers and nearly 200 men, whose souls were well prepared for death. Good saviour of the world, will you deem to bring peace and abolish all war forever? This entry is from New Year's Eve, the 31st of December, 1914. New Year's Day, I intend saying Mass for the battalion in the further down billets, where I set it for them last Sunday. It is very, very hard there to prepare any kind of a decent and commodious place for the Mass. But still I decide it is my duty to be there and celebrate for the men, be the difficulty at all sufferable as it is. I met several of the men who had just come from the trenches, a few hundred yards distance. They were a most pitiable and heart-rendering sight, steeped and soaked in mud to the loins. One man handed me his overcoat to feel the weight of it. I do not exaggerate when I say that it was nearly two stone in weight, all mud, hardened and kind of frozen into it. The men have to try and use three coats to shelter themselves from both rain and cold. This is fighting under the most appalling mud conditions. And as I said, it wasn't all. Horrendous. There was moments of levity. Here they have a great conversation about a turnip, whether it is a turnip or not. And Denny's gets a great advertisement as well when the packages arrive from home. And I apologise that the date is February 2015. Of course, it should be 1915. But on, a few weeks before that, Father Gleason wrote, they christened the bill at the hotel the tip as a compliment to the chaplain. And in the morning, O'Brien the cook was up at all hours collecting wood lighting a fire and in bathe of bread lest he should wake me, inquiring to know what the priest would like for breakfast. Pick or thin rashers, tea or coffee, jam or butter. Another man carefully collected my boots, piled with mud, and proceeded to do a great job on them. However, I was sad during the night, for all through the long times I could hear the poor chaps coughing, that graveyard cough which is so sudden and so upsetting. The poor fellows whose frames shook when these frequent fits seized them, you know, this is a hospital too, Father, says one of the boys. I soon realized the truth, when once the silence of sleep came on. I felt for those poor men, the victims of the 17 days in the trenches, men who would rather be in hospital than in action. 
Outside it blew violent and rained heavily all night and the prospect in the morning was anything but cheerful. The good news is abroad that the battalion comes to Bethune to rest on Monday the 8th. The next entry is my favourite entry out of all of his diaries, but I always feel when I read it that I'm intruding. The 2nd of March 1915. The monsters were beginning to assemble for our little evening service. Suddenly a shrill, plaintive, crooning wail broke the stillness, so far undisturbed by even the crack of a rifle or the boom of a gun, near though it is to the trenches. All eyes were turned towards the entrance gate of the chateau, and they saw a party of kilted Highlanders slowly advance. Leading the sad procession was the piper, playing flowers of the forest, with a sad and touching pathos. The note shrilled, cried and wailed. It was terribly pathetic, the whole affair. The music, the bearers carrying their dead comrades, the sympathetic monsters, the weeping French villagers, the sad-faced children, the gaunt trees, the gaping grave, the whole wood, a network of trenches, barricades and defences, and the scores of little white crosses marking the graves of men who had given their lives for the same cause as the one being now carried to his rest. The sad procession wended its slow way round the lake and then began the ascent of the hill. The body was laid down and the Presbytery minister, chaplain to the Highlanders, read the funeral service. So they laid their beloved Highlander in peace. Beside him on every side lay the bodies of soldiers belonging to different regiments and killed at various dates since the war started. There also lies a monster boy named Carson who was killed around Christmas 1914. Several soldiers beheld the scene from the roadside and all were deeply affected by it. As I said, I don't really want to depress you all, so just a lighter entry from later on. Even at 11 o'clock at night, you may see a few boys cooking their slices of ham and boiling a mess tin of water for cha. Now, for anybody who doesn't know what cha is, tea. No stretch of imagination, I know it, for I have seen it, can exaggerate the variety, quaintness, extremeness and humour of the varied occupations of the trench dwellers. Take O'Brien, who looks after my old boy. Well, he is about the most perfect drummer up one could meet. Even if mud is knee deep in the trench, as it sometimes is, O'Brien will drum up again and produce an appetising drop of cha and a delicious plateful of bacon. He resorts to the most fanciful and pragmatic ways of providing against all eventualities. He will cook during a tornado, a hurricane, a blizzard, a typhoon, an earthquake, a deluge, or a German attack. He will fetch water at the risk of his own life, carrying it in oriental or any other fashion through the communication trench at any inconvenience. Had the pleasure of a couple of meals of O'Brien's cooking during my stay in Trenchland. But of course, Father Gleeson is best remembered for the Battle of Aubert Ridge or the Rue de Bois, which was situated about 500 yards from the British trenches. So on Friday the 7th of May, the diary entry goes, we're to proceed to Rue de Bois tonight, but the order was cancelled for some reason. The men are in great spirits. It rained in the evening, and I was glad we were not marching out to battle on such a gloomy and dripping <coughs> evening. The following day, we march out from Tomb Willow, about 900 strong, our commanding officer being Major Rickard and the adjutant, Captain Fitzpatrick, two of the kindest men I've come across. We leave around seven o'clock. The scenes of enthusiasm are extraordinary. I rode on my horse, gave absolution to the battalion during rest on the road opposite La Couton Church. Between the shrines of Notre Dame de la Bonne Moor and another shrine, we have another rest. The men will sing hymns, especially here, Glory St. Patrick. I go further up near the trenches and bid goodbye to all. So sad. And of course, many of you may recognize this as the famous absolution at the Rue du Bois. And this scene was painted by Matania and published in the Christmas edition of the Sphere magazine. Now, Matania was not obviously present to paint it, but he drew it from a description in the book published by Major Rickard's wife, Louisa. But it soon became one of the most famous paintings of the First World War. It was reproduced a year later in the Weekly Freeman, and it was framed at home in many of the homes throughout Munster. Now, the original was an oil and canvas, and there are lots of theories as to what happened to it. One is that it was hanging in a church in somewhere in the UK that got bombed during the Second World War. Um, but recently, an oil and canvas has been found, 
and work is currently ongoing to see if in fact it may be the original. But anyway, the 9th of May. The famous 9th of May, what a day for the monsters. We lose at least 350 men between killed, wounded and missing. Attack started at five o'clock. I sat up in my bivouac, listening to the boom of the guns, thinking of the poor boys making their marching charge. Airplanes busy. Spent all night trying to console, aid and remove the wounded. It was ghastly to see them lying there in cold, cheerless outhouses, on bare stretchers with no blanket to cover their freezing limbs. I shall never forget that young officer with the shattered left arm, now how Barndale of the Welsh, who was a great organist and played for me in SR. Heart-wrenching to see him dying there, wasting away, hundreds lying out in the cold air all night at Windy Corner. No ambulances coming. They came at last at daylight. And that's just more of the diary entry there. So Wednesday, the 12th of May, it was so sad to see scores of dead lying in the cemetery, laid right awaiting burial. There in the twilight and after the din of battle had ceased, all was so mournful, so awful. What an impression it was making my mind, whether I like it or not. Barry, the hero of Captain Hawke's rescue, was amongst those I buried. And this is the diary entry for Ascension Thursday, the 13th of May, when the survivors got together. The roll call of the monsters on Monday was the saddest thing imaginable. In the field beside St. Mary's, the little tent chapel the artillery chaps erected for us, the four companies all sat round on the dry grass. One company was called at a time. Everybody was worn, sad, depressed, after the loss of so many loved comrades. Some had lost brothers, others cousins but all had lost good and faithful companions. The sergeant major called out name after name. Killed, wounded, missing was answered according to the faith of each. Now, one of the other things that Father Gleeson was extraordinary about was that he felt he had a duty of care to the families of the men he served with. He wrote to them to tell them if their relatives had been wounded, killed or were missing in action. And sometimes he wrote just to see if they had learned anything that he didn't know. He obviously didn't have to do this, which I think makes him more extraordinary. And most of the letters we have in the archives are from in around late 1917. And we only have two pages from a diary at that time. And on the 19th of December, Father Gleeson wrote, Frost continues, finished the writing and dispatching of about 85 letters to friends of missing men and battalion, since 10th of November. Drafted one copy and duplicated on repeat paper. It would be some consolation to those poor people to get some hope and news for Christmas. Took two very hard days work to get through them, but one feels it's a work of true charity. So the first letter is from Elizabeth Meany from Dorset Street in Dublin. And she's absolutely delighted that Father Gleeson has taken the time to write to her. And she is equally happy to tell him that her son, is a prisoner in Germany. Mrs. Kern from Belfast, the same thing. Her husband was reported missing and she's absolutely delighted that Father Gleeson has written and crying about him. And again, she's very happy to tell him that he is a prisoner of war in Dolman in Germany. Poor Mrs. Roger Campbell from Glasgow isn't having as good a time. She has four sons at the front and the youngest, whose name is William, um, was known to Father Gleeson and he's missing. She has no word of him. Father Gleeson has no word of him. But she is absolutely delighted to learn that William had been so attentive to his religious duties. So she got some consolation in that. Now, about two years ago, after we had done our transcription work, we were approached by UCD Digital Library regarding the digitization of the actual collection. Now, we'd never done anything like this before, and we certainly had never worked with an outside body, and neither had they. Um, but after a few conversations, and um, you know, ensuring that everything was going to be done to the best possible standard, I put the proposal to Archbishop Martin, and he gave us his blessing. Um, so the items left the diocese and were put in the special repository in UCD. I returned a few days later and um, what was 30 items was now 670 files in the digital world. 
Um, it was a very positive collaboration and it was received very, very well. And in the first week when it was launched, there was 18,000 hits on the Father Gleason papers in the library alone. So we were delighted with that. Um, what we learned about Father Gleason from his papers, the profound and simple faith of people, of the men he served with and him, it's extraordinary. The story after story of men dying, clutching their rosary beads, or three or four hundred people turning up at a moment's notice to hear mass in a bombed out barn or in a trench. The connection to home was very important. If you met anybody, it didn't matter if they were from Dublin, Tipperary, Kerry, it was that wonderful Irish thing of who do we have in common, who do we know, and they always ended up having somebody and there was always great banter. Um, the resolve to carry on, no matter what happened, and that can especially be seen after the Battle of the Rue de Bois. And he also was great because he talks about ordinary life, the destruction of property, but the cross and coffin makers, conversations with them, the miners going about their daily work, the farmers, the orphans that were left behind, and even the poor abandoned cats get a mention on more than one occasion. Um, the letters and diary are a surviving record of one man's experiences. They aren't easy reading in parts and you really would have to have a heart of stone not to be affected by them. Uh, as I said to you earlier, he has a wonderful way of writing, a wonderful way of putting you right in the midst of things and as I said, sometimes you feel as if you're actually an intruder. But by preserving them, by transcribing them, by making them available both in the diocesan archives and through the digital library, Father Gleeson, and more importantly, his experiences will be recognised as an extremely valuable resource for anyone reading or working about any aspect of the First World War. Thank you. Thank you, Noel, for a fabulous talk. Um, how interesting. And um, what a wonderful man was Father Gleeson. Um, how interesting also that his mother said that he was not physically or mentally capable of taking up a position as chaplain with the um, Munster Fusiliers. Why do you think she said mentally or mentally especially? Well, I think she probably, he, I think he was probably one of the youngest in the family. And speaking as a mother, if my son told me he was joining the army, I would do everything in my power, especially if I knew he was going to go off to war. I think you just... You just, you're envisioning the worst that he's going to see and encounter and everything. And I mean, that happened because I suppose, especially after the Battle of the Rue de Bois, especially, there were so many of his regiment killed. They had 19 officers and over 350 of the men killed that day that it took a huge toll on him. And when he came back to Dublin, like he had, a, for, for, it was post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, um, and he was out in holes recuperating. And there's a couple of letters in the collection um, to Archbishop Walsh where he, he just is saying, like, and he has this guilt of not being out there with them and all the rest of it. And he got, like, he, he was made a curate in a chapel very close to the city centre and all the rest of it, but, like, that want to go back. You know, he felt, I think, he'd abandoned the men, that they needed him, and... He just had to go back. Um, but I can understand where his mother was coming from. <laughs> there was great camaraderie between the men, and there was a great devotion and dedication to each other. Uh, and I think that comes out in, in his writings as well. Um, and it's interesting that he, he appears to be a very simple man in many ways. He was not, um, he does not, to any great extent, become emotional in his diaries. He keeps things very simple. Yeah, he, he, he says it as it is, like he just expressed, now, I mean, there are a couple of funny occasions, I think, they saw the Prince of Wales one day, and he, he, he makes some comments like that he wasn't a very manly looking man or something like that, you know, but in general, you know, it is, you know, sort of, he has a job to do, he takes it extremely seriously, but because of the fact he wasn't somebody who was 20 miles away from the fighting, he was in the trenches with the men, there is one extraordinary extract in the diary where there's an explosion one night and he's actually in the trenches, but 
because the fighting happened, he had been abandoned by, you know, obviously the other soldiers around the place had actually gone out to fight. And eventually where he was collapsed and he was nearly buried alive underneath it. And he, it is the fear when you read that part of his diary. He's absolutely terrified, but it didn't stop him. You know, he was there, that's what it was about. And, you know, he just, they were all so close to him and all the rest of it. I think it's very sad because I think the guy who did service, he's old by the Sergeant O'Leary, ended up getting killed at some stage along the way as well. So, I mean, he did, he suffered a lot. But even when he came back to Dublin, he, the poor of Dublin were very important to him, you know, and he became very actively involved in what was the Guild of the Little Flower, which still runs today. And um, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I had a phone call from a sister working in the parish in Mead Street that a prize bond that Father Gleeson had bought many years ago had won a prize. But the people in the prize bond office would not believe he was dead because she didn't have a death cert. So we came up with, with like, I mean, the man was born in 1884, like, you know. Um, but anyway, between the jigs and the reels, she eventually, and they wouldn't even tell her how much she'd won. We were all really excited. He was 10 euros. <laughs> <laughs> but he was thinking all the time. And, you know, so, and he is, like, I mean, it, even in the last year or so, any of the parishes he served in, a lot of them, that painting, they had it reproduced. Um, the British Legion in Dublin had a series of those paintings commissioned um, to raise funds for the British Legion for ex-servicemen. And um, there's one definitely hanging in Dolphins Barn Parish in Dublin as well now. So, you still remember it. Um, questions for Noel. We have a question down here at the back, so I'd have to make my way down. Let me just bring the uh, microphone to you because we can't actually hear you. We can't hear you up the, uh, at the top. So I'm going to bring the microphone down to you and come in to you. There we go. Hello. I want to ask about the painting that you're talking about. Was that meant to represent Father Peterson himself or was that a sort of generalised image of a priest giving absolute? No, it was meant to represent Father Peterson. Ah, thank yeah. you. But in fact, there's the way that the sign of the cross is, or the blessing has been given apparently is the Anglican way of doing it. <laughs> or it's the way the Pope do, does it, so you can... <laughs> Other questions for Noel? How many people here had actually um, sort of fought in with the, with the monsters, with the monster fusiliers? One person here, another, two, three, all right, so you have a photograph? And we have um, and Michael as well. Where's Michael? Yeah, yeah. Were they with the most of years, Michael? I think so. Honestly. Say a few words about your relative. Well, I know very little about him. Only um, I happened to be in the RDS library one time and I was looking through the temporary dead of the post war war. And I seen Thomas Leeson, son of Bridget, and John Leeson and Brandeline Nina. He said, my goodness, that's the name of the top of the headstone that my parents were buried in. And I did more research, and seemingly he was the um, second cousin of my father's. And uh, we never knew it, the family never mentioned it, I never heard it being mentioned, you know, because all his brothers and sisters, none of them were married. But that line of our, our family on my father's side had died out. But I knew, I knew um, the last of the family, Steve, who died in 1973. He had the grave to my father. He said, I'm the last to look after that grave. That's where my father and mother were buried in this bunny outside in the old abbey. But um, I, I looked it up and I, I came across it there recently. He was um, killed in September uh, 1916. It's coming up now. And his name is on that monument. It's a bad monument. That's all I know about him. I've no photographs of him. That's what the only connection I made. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's probably quite common, maybe you've come across this, Noel, that the men who died in World War I actually, a lot of them have been forgotten. Yeah, I th well I think a lot of that is probably due to 1916 and what happened as a result, but it has been incredible over the last two years to see the amount of interest that there is taken and the commemoration ceremonies that have been taking place. And there's been work done by so many people around the place. The Linster Fusiliers, 
with Tom Burke. They have done fantastic work in identifying a lot of people. And there's a guy by the name of David Power with South County Dublin Libraries, and he is working on a project, and it's, it's, it's nearly like a mini biography of every Irishman that they can find who fought in the First World War, because I know there have been projects launched um, from information that was gathered maybe 30, 40 years ago, but it has been proved to be incorrect. So there, there's a lot going on. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because the, a lot of the, few, the monster fuseliers would have died on the battlefield. Do we know how many of them were never recovered and are still lying out there? Not a clue. I couldn't tell you. Because right. um, one of the, one of the uh, big projects that is happening now with DNA, of course, is that we're beginning to use DNA to identify the remains of soldiers that are found uh, in the green fields of France. Um, and they reckon between 30 and 60 bodies are being recovered every year from Flanders. And um, uh, now we're in a position where we will be able to use DNA to identify a lot of these soldiers. Uh, you might have heard of um, the Fromel um, incident a couple of years ago, 2009, in Fromel, they found a mass grave with 250 soldiers. And that had been missed after the war. And they'd lain there in this mass grave for 90 years. They dug them up, there were 250 soldiers, and using a mixture of artifactual evidence and DNA, they've identified 144 of those men. Uh, Paddy and a uh, gentleman over here as well. Let's take uh, Paddy first. Uh. Now, I would mention that David Parr, you said, is doing a project on all the Irishmen who served. Jared Brown in Ennis is doing a similar project on the Fairman, which you can read his ongoing reports on the Fair Library website, fairlibrary.ie. But the big problem is the number of Irish people who served in armies other than the UK Army who have been completely forgotten and not documented and we keep discovering more and more people, especially who served in the US forces, where it was a shortcut to your citizenship to sign up at the end of the war when the US entered. I know of my four grandparents, three had brothers who served in the First World War, the fourth had only sisters, and of those three men, two were in the US forces and one in the UK forces. So if any of you know of any Irish men who served in overseas armies in World War I, Please let somebody in Ireland who's doing one of these collections know about them because they may be completely forgotten and left out of the record. Now, uh, what took me most in what you quoted there was in the diary of Christmas 1914, where he says that the, that the hearts of all men are to bleed, and then he calls upon the Saviour to end war forever. There are interesting parallels here with um, a fellow I've done a good bit of work on, Father John Fackey, who was a native of Clonoff in the parish of Rossmore here in Tipperary, who served with the Australian forces and was part of the um, Anzac landing at Gallipoli on the 25th of April, roughly two weeks before the Battle of Warfare Ridge, which Father Gleeson was at. And there's a very long and graphic description of the blood and the slaughter and um, offers a opinion at the end that he hoped he's in the, the end of war and, and the horrors of war. There's, inter there's also an interesting difference between the two. Father Gleeson seems to be a very delicate man, but Father John Fackley was very much a man's man. He served as the, the timber workers in the outback in Western Australia, rode a horse and all the rest of it, and his own way was quite massive, I suppose, but at the end of the day, also questioned the war. So I thought it was interesting there that, that Father Gleeson was at least questioning and critical about the war. And I wonder if you might just develop that on a wee bit, whether there's anything later on that he's also um, being critical of questioning the whole business of, of, of the war itself. There's only two mentions in his diary to, I suppose, questioning the war. The one I told you there, and there's another one where, again, it's, he goes on about some guy called Bernardi, and I think who's written many treatises on war. And he kind of gives out about him, kind of going, well, come and spend some time here. And you certainly wouldn't be promoting that people should be here. Um, he doesn't talk about it any more than that. You know, he, he doesn't get into the politics of the war. Um, when he eventually leaves, he becomes involved as a national chaplain with the Free State Army. 
and with the Irish Army for quite a number of years, I think right up until like the late 1920s, um, early 1930s. But there's nothing surviving to say what his overall views on the war were. Any other comments or questions? Um, 1916, of course, happened right in the middle of Father, um, Father Gleason's uh, stint in World War I in 1914-15, and then going back later on. When he went back, how did he find the Munster Fusiliers? Had they been, were they conflicted by what was going on in Ireland? Again, I haven't done a lot of work on this, but having read a few bits and pieces, I suppose, as kind of background material, it split people. And you can see that even, we we'll say, further on into the War of Independence and the Civil War, where you have some ended up being anti-treatyites, some being treatyites, and it, it really came down to very much, you know, kind of people's personal opinion or belief or whatever. Um, for a lot of the men that came back, I mean, they didn't live very long after coming back. You know, they, they, they had such horrific injuries and everything was just, you know, and for others, I think they just kept quiet about what it was they had been involved with. Um, but there are, there definitely has been work done, but I expect that because, in a sense, it's nearly a new area of study because people can actually talk about it now. I think it's going to be interesting to see what comes out in about the next decade on things like that because I think it's the first time people are actually going to be able to really look at sources because with a lot of the archival material it has been closed and it hasn't been available because people have been alive or because of the upset it may actually cause. So I think there's lots to be discovered out there yet. Well, um, Noelle, I'd just like to thank you for a fantastic presentation and uh, can we put our hands together for Noelle Thank you very much.